Hello, welcome back to part four in our five video series on glass, this amazing material that we can do so much with. Let's dive in and see what we can pick up this time. Well, where are we going? We're still in the technology and the art side of things, but this time I want to focus a little bit more uh, on glass in terms of its use in science, um, in technology in terms of consumer products and um, very much in the domestic area as well in, in, in our kitchens. Um, the beautiful backdrop you can see behind me today is, a, is another image that um, was kindly made available to me by Grace Asen, local glass artist as I might have mentioned already. This is actually a detail from a stained glass uh, window installation at Canterbury Cathedral. Uh, this is uh, an Amicia um, from a glass uh, panel called the Damson Tree. So in terms of science and technology, glass has been used um, for millennia. Uh, the Romans, as we can see here top left on the screen, uh, actually produced glass containers to uh, provide measures of volume. So they could measure fluids out in all these different um, standardized sizes. So, you know, even back then, a couple of thousand years ago, uh, glass was being used um, in a commercial sense at the very least. Uh, if we come up to date, of course, those of you who've seen the um, Millennium Seed Bank buildings at Kew Gardens will uh, realize that um, these fairly standard um, scientific and um, almost domestic, I suppose, storage jars uh, are used even today to keep um, supplies of rare or endangered seeds for posterity. Uh, and these resealable jars, for instance, uh, I've got um, in my garage full of um, bottled fruit from our garden to store over the winter. But of course in chemical laboratories for centuries we've had specialised uh, pieces of glassware and of course where will we be in terms of biology for instance without the, uh, the microscope, these are very old specimens um, from the Royal College of Surgeons I think. Um, but it illustrates the point, the whole of science depended upon, and in fact many ways still depends upon, the use of glass. Uh, it's a vital component and of course astronomy is one of the areas that rely on, on glass still. This happens to be my telescope. Um, this is um, I think about three hours after it arrived at my house, so it's being unpacked, set up. And just for good measure, I've shown you a couple of the images that I've captured through this telescope in the intervening couple of years of the moon uh, on the right there and of um, Jupiter uh, over on the left. So a whole range of scientific instruments, of scientific glassware in general, uh, has been crucial, vital, in fact, for the development of modern science. Uh, we wouldn't have astronomy, we wouldn't have microscopy and, and the uh, microbiology that goes with it um, without the existence of glass. And there are lots of examples we can point to, never-ending uh, collection within the realms of science and indeed technology. So we've got an old print here of one of um, Edison's electric light bulbs. Uh, glowing filament inside uh, this sealed glass vessel and the fact that this vessel was able to maintain a vacuum uh, or later on to hold an inert gas was crucial, absolutely crucial in the development of light bulbs. So even in that regard glass has been, still is, absolutely vital. This is the underside of one of the space shuttles, no longer in use of course, but the glass ceramic tiles uh, 
that are on the bottom of the space shuttle are still the sort of material that gets used um, for um, heat shields on spacecraft and so on for re-entry. <coughs> Excuse me, and most recently for cometary uh, return samples and lunar return samples that we've had from uh, Chinese and Japanese space missions. Uh, touch screens, of course, are all over the place now. F everything from our smartphones to um, uh, touch screen tablets and um, computers and so on, all dependent upon glass. And fiber optics. Fiber optic communication is ubiquitous now, not just for carrying uh, um, telephone calls and the like, uh, but of course for all of our data needs, so streaming our television programs and uh, seeing um, all sorts of video material flashed around the world in, in um, very short order. We can see examples of um, the physics that drives a lot of this high-end technology in some very simple, almost mundane uh, areas. So. Uh, the um, flower vase that I'm holding up to the light there, this is a talk I gave in the um, Canterbury Heritage Museum when it was still open, um, so many years ago now. Uh, you can see that the glass material is, is pretty much clear. Um, there was a slight hint of colouring in it, but not much. However, if I shone my UV torch into it, you can see that it changes its appearance significantly. In fact, it fluoresces. And it fluoresces because this particular Caithness vase uh, contains neodymium, which is uh, a f just an element in the periodic table, albeit a fairly esoteric one. But this has the property that it will fluoresce under ultraviolet illumination. Now, neodymium can also be used in fiber optic communication um, and this is probably a good point uh, to switch cameras now and just to take a look uh, at some of these materials and, and illustrate their use. So here's my little collection of bits and pieces for this talk. Um, I'll try and show you some things closer up so let me move this camera down uh, a little bit to give us a um, hopefully better view um, and the things I suppose that I can tell you about straight away uh, are the hardened glass, the tough glass that's used on the front of our um, mobile phones for instance. This is an extremely strong piece of, very thin piece of glass uh, that will protect the front of your phone um, and it's rather clever because of course you can still touch these and the screen behind the main phone screen will pick them up it's a very similar material to the phone screen itself in fact so this is a piece of glass technology that's um, come into its own in recent years and all of our touch screens will have um, glass fabricated in this sort of a way and we'll come back to that uh, in a little bit because it's worth following up um, a little bit further. But I mentioned fibre optics, uh, for instance, and it might be an idea to have a peek at a little bit of um, fibre optic material. Now, a fibre optic um, is pretty much what the name implies. It is a glass fibre um, through which we pass light and um, we can put information in there as well. So if I get this up close to the camera, um, you know, here's a fairly simple fibre of glass. In fact, I picked this up from the floor of a glass blowing demonstration um, during a visit to um, Venice a few years ago. So it's just waste product that came from, from what this glass blower was doing. Um, it travelled safely back to my suitcase, I should add, because I stuck it in the band of my hat uh, and it stayed protected for the day. Fiber optic cables for communication purposes are much thinner than that. I mean, we're talking about fibers that have been stretched out so that they're thin enough to be 
about a millionth of a meter in diameter. So these are really very, very tiny uh, pieces, but they start life um, in this form. And this is going to be very hard to see. I'll illuminate it for you in a little bit. Uh, but in the middle of this stub of glass, uh, there is something rather special. You can probably just about pick it out uh, in this image, but I'm going to show you it in much more detail in a minute. But this takes us back to our vase, to our Caithness vase that was um, that had had some neodymium metal put into it, and that gave it its fluorescent property under ultraviolet. This precursor to a fiber optic cable also has neodymium in it uh, and it doesn't fluoresce in the case of, of this cable but if we use it in the right way, illuminate it in the right way, it will actually enable us to switch light pulses and to amplify light pulses. So in terms of optical electronics and optical computing these sorts of materials are vital now, why does it look chunky like this? This is about a centimetre in diameter, not a millionth of a metre. It's because this is the way a glass fibre uh, starts its life. So it'll be um, made into something that's easily manageable, you know, this sort of big size here, a centimetre diameter. And we'll have a rod of, well, it's sort of almost arbitrary length, but 30 centimetres, 50 centimetres is, is not atypical. Certainly for a, a research material, which is what this was. Uh, this was um, given to me by um, the company that I was um, doing some, some work for at the time, some research for. So this rod will be gripped at one end, and then the other end will be stretched. Right, there'll be a little band of the glass that was heated up to softening point. So we just keep stretching, we keep stretching and moving this heating zone further along our glass rod. And out of a rod that length uh, of this diameter, we can get something that's a kilometre or so long. So you can see how this scales down. As it gets longer, this diameter goes down. And this is just the bit that's left at the end. This is the bit that was being held at one end while the other end was being pulled, um, having been softened uh, by a heating ring. So it's the stub left from a fibre optic cable. Now I said I'd try and show you uh, the cable, um, the core of this thing. So most of this is just glass cladding, I should say. It's just the core of this that forms the active component. So let me try using a laser pointer now just to show you um, where the core is. Can you just see that red line through the centre there? Let me try and move the camera down a bit and we'll try and pick this out in more, um, in more detail. Or better still, I'll move this up to the camera. All right, so I'm just going to put some of my laser pen light into one end. And I hope now you can see uh, the middle of this cylinder is a different sort of glass. It's glowing red there. Might actually be easier if we use green light to show this up. So let's put some green light through. It's a little bright, unfortunately. But there, you can see that there is a core there that's, um, that's a slightly different colour. It's affecting the light in a slightly different way. And that's the glass that is uh, doped. It's got a little bit of neodymium in it. It's doped with neodymium. And that's the bit that will give this fibre optic its uh, cable its properties. Um, we might even be able to see it uh, fairly clearly down here with this green light. No, maybe not. So fibre optic cables then um, come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and they can be used in computing and all the rest of it. Now this is a bit of a cheat 
this is actually um, plastic inside, clear plastic inside a dark plastic sleeve, but it illustrates the point um, when it comes to the operation of fibre optic cables. So if I stick um, green light in one end you can see that it comes all the way around this plastic cable and out the other side. Uh, and that's it's quite a bendy um, setup here so it's easily going around those uh, those bends um, and coming through to the other side. And it's a rather special process that gives rise to this. Technically it's called total internal reflection. So what it means is that once you launch light into these fiber optic uh, cables, it will bounce around inside um, as though the um, as though the sides, the edges, I should say, of that middle bit, that core bit, um, are behaving like a perfect mirror. So there are no losses on reflection at all. It just carries on until it comes out the other side. And that's why we can now cable the world, essentially, with fiber optic cables. It's amazing stuff. Okay, let's go back to our slides and we'll uh, pursue this subject a little bit further. Well, now we come to the subject of toughening glass and toughened glass is around us everywhere. Um, shop front windows, glass doors, for instance, uh, into shops, um, car windscreens, for instance, all made from toughened glass. And originally, and in fact, in some cases still, uh, a way of doing that was to take the molten glass or the softened glass, at least, that you've created your sheet out of or whatever it is, and cool the outside very quickly compared to the inside. And what that did was to cause the outside to contract a little bit as it cooled down from its um, soft state into a solid state, while the inside was still a little bit soft. That cooled down later on. So we have this hard skin now that isn't mobile, that isn't moving, uh, and then the inside actually cools down later on and we end up with the outer layer being sort of held in compressive stress. It's being pulled inwards and that gives us a very tough skin on the outside. Um, and, you know, one can produce toughened glass like these touchscreen materials and so on in that way. Um, and one of the very early and quite dramatic demonstrations uh, of this, and a very simple demonstration in fact, are these um, things that you can see on the screen called Prince Rupert drops. And they are drops in name and drops in nature. So essentially someone has uh, melted drips of glass off a glass rod uh, and allowed those drips to fall into, say, a bucket of water. So this is going to give us immediately an outside layer that will cool and solidify rapidly, whereas the inside will cool a little bit more slowly and will pull in those outer layers um, and give us this tough skin on the outside. Um, and I've got a couple of examples of Prince Rupert drops uh, here. I'll hold them up. Uh, to the camera. You can probably see them as well on this camera as uh, as with the other one. Um, so this head, I'm, I can't demonstrate it because I don't have um, you know cameras that will do this justice, but this head is so tough that I can put it between a pair of pliers and squeeze with all my might and it won't break. Uh, I could hit it with a hammer in fact. Um, and when I've done these talks face to face with people, that's indeed what I've been able to demonstrate to them. But this thin tail, if you can see it up here, um, that's not going to be toughened like the head of the drop. And that's because it's thin. 
so it's going to cool at pretty much the same rate. So this is just a solid bit of glass fibre up here. So if I were to snip through this bit up here, what it does is to start releasing the tension that's built up in this glass uh, through the fast cooling process that we've given it. Uh, and essentially the glass will disintegrate into powder and you can see a wave of disintegration coming all the way through until the head itself um, falls apart explosively. I mean, there's a bit of a noise associated with it. Um, and that, of course, is why on um, trains and buses and so on, uh, and for emergency exits where we have glass doors involved in, in stores and office box and so on, uh, there will be a little pointy hammer somewhere nearby for emergency use. And it does much the same thing as snapping the tail on there. All you've got to do is to break that tough layer at one point. So hitting it with our pointed hammer, for instance, uh, on a train window uh, will again release all of that pent up tension uh, in the skin and the entire glass panel drop in this case but on a in a railway carriage the entire panel uh, will disintegrate into small pieces. Uh, now the clever bit of course in terms of, of car windscreens, tra train windows, that sort of stuff, is that it would have been made with a layer of um, plastic between two glass plates, two toughened glass plates. So although the glass will shatter, it won't actually do so explosively and shower everybody nearby with bits of glass because actually it's bonded to this bit of plastic in the middle. Um, but now our door, our window has been weakened sufficiently that we can simply push it out. Um, it's, it's as flexible as the plastic layer in the middle now. So it's very easy to, um, to push it and remove it. Uh, anyone who suffered a cracked windscreen uh, in a car will know the effect all too well. So that's toughened glass by essentially thermally treating it. Uh, we can do it another way though, we can do this chemically. Uh, we need to produce just the same effect. So we can toughen, for instance, a soda lime glass, and remember this was silica, sand, uh, with added sodium and that came from our originally in our old-fashioned um, recipe from um, seaweed but chemically it's just um, soda it's sodium oxide that gets added to reduce the melting point remember but chemically we can allow potassium atoms which are slightly bigger than their neighbour in the periodic table, sodium, we can allow those to diffuse into the surface layers of the glass and swap with sodium. So these come in as ions, in fact, they're positively charged potassium ions and we've got positively charged sodium ions in our glass and they'll simply swap over and that's entirely feasible just for a few atomic layers into the surface of the glass, so incredibly thin layer we're talking about. And we've now swapped something that's quite small for something that's much bigger. And that creates for us again this compressive tension, uh, stress, sorry, in the surface, of, surface layer of the glass. It's created for us a toughened skin. But we've done it now chemically rather than needing to shock cool uh, our glass as we did for the um, uh, for the Prince Rupert drops. Uh, they're called Prince Rupert by the way because famously this was shown to him as a demonstration experiment way back so you know the chap who got to um, see it and applaud the demonstration uh, had his name given to the um, given to the fun. Now, once we've got toughened glass, of course, we can do all sorts of amazing things with it. So, you know, we can stand over the Alps, um, as you can uh, see in that picture in the top left. Or uh, 
we can view the Earth from above, uh, from the um, observation cupola in the International Space Station, uh, which I'd love to be able to do. I just wouldn't be able to make the journey. Um, but you'll notice, one of the things you'll notice in this straight away is that this chap um, is standing over the edge of uh, one of the Alpine peaks, but he's doing so wearing soft slippers. Uh, and there's a very, very good reason for that. If he'd walked out here in a pair of ordinary um, outdoor shoes, and they had, for instance, picked up a bit of grit in the tread, he could have had an effect on this glass plate here, exactly the same as hitting your train window with the little pointy hammer that they have up nearby in case of emergency. Um, he'd have destroyed that tiny, that very thin layer of toughened glass on the outer surface the whole thing would have disintegrated as all that compressive stress was released and um, he'd have needed a parachute at that point. So wearing um, uh, soft outer shoes uh, onto this is, is most definitely a good idea. But let's have a look at a few other examples because there's a lot of fun things we can do with glass now that we've, uh, now that we've toughened it. So we could walk out over the Grand Canyon, for instance. Uh, when I was at the Grand Canyon, uh, this didn't exist, which is a great shame, and I'm unlikely ever to go back and be able to try it, but I have to say I would dearly love to be able to do so. Um, or if you were to go to Los Angeles, there's a glass slide that goes down the outside of a high-rise building. So you can actually um, uh, simply slide down uh, to, uh, to the bottom of the building on the outside on this glass slide. And you'll notice again the very sensible use of a rug to go down on. This is not simply so that you build up speed, this is because the, absolutely the last thing you want to be doing is scratching that toughened surface as you go. Or if you get a holiday to uh, China sometime in your life, try walking around this cliff edge on a glass walkway or across a ravine on a glass bridge. Uh, all eminently possible, all I have to say things I would dearly love to be able to do uh, but um, almost certainly never will. Uh, but you know glass being used architecturally uh, or in an engineering sense really I suppose in these contexts uh, is still such an amazing material. So we've got everything from weights and measures and scientific instruments um, and you know telescope mirrors and lenses through fiber optic communications uh, to um, touristy things like this. Uh, utterly astonishing. Okay so we're gonna we're gonna take a bit of a sidestep now and we're gonna go into commercial wear. Uh, and I just want to illustrate a few things about how um, some of these important products came into being. So this is a um, copy of a logbook entry uh, by a guy called um, Otto Schott. Now Otto Schott was an extremely important um, glass technologist, glass engineer, glass scientist, I don't know what we call him. Uh, but he was uh, working back in the 19th century, so in, in what in the UK would be called our Victorian age. Uh, and this is one of his notebooks. He was working in, um, uh, in Germany, um, in, uh, and the, the uh, factory where a lot of his stuff came to fruition was in, uh, in a very pretty German town called Jena. And this is just showing one of the batch mixes for a particular type of glass that he was experimenting with. Uh, this wasn't random, he was gradually um, zeroing in on something that he thought might be interesting. But it was still trial and error. It was put a little bit of this in, what happens? What if we put a little more in or a little less in? Uh, or swap it out for something slightly different. 
So there's all sorts of um, um, standard materials, pretty standard materials in here. So we've got sodium added, we've got various other things. There's some magnesium here, I can see some zinc, aluminium. Um, he was zeroing in on a particular property that he wanted to exploit and the key entry is this one here which I've highlighted uh, over here on the right hand side um, he's got in uh, this is potassium uh, borate but the key thing is this the B in the middle boron and if you remember back to the second video in the series boron was one of those things I highlighted as being an element that can form uh, a network for a glass but it doesn't do it using the sort of pyramidal tripe structures that silicon does it actually forms rings with oxygen and it's those rings uh, that um, join together and produce our glass network but he added a little bit of boron in this mix and what he got essentially was pyrex he came out with the recipe for a form of glass uh, that was transparent but that wouldn't expand or shrink when we heated it or cooled it. Its coefficient of expansion, if I put it scientifically, was very, very low. Um, and that meant um, you could stick it in an oven, as this old advertisement tells you, bring it out uh, into the cold, even put it into cold water and it's not going to um, it's not going to sp uh, smash and this was nicknamed at the time as you can see down here fire glass so by this almost trial and error method not quite but almost um, Otto Schott came out with an amazing material um, you know, really nice, um, useful domestic thing like this small casserole. This is actually a survival um, from a quite a large collection of these that we had as wedding gifts. Um, so this is now more than four decades old and still going strong, um, still doing its job now. Uh, the um, recipe for this I have to say moved to the United States after the Second World War uh, and um, the Corning glassworks in the United States uh, took over the patent and began marketing this then as Parex. Parex is their name uh, for this material. It's actually a borosilicate glass uh, which is the name I gave to it in the second video series when we were looking at the chemical components of glass. So this is one domestic use uh, for um, a particular type of glass. Uh, we've mentioned fibre optics already. Um, and fibre optic glass is a very specialised form. It's actually uh, mostly silica, as is you know, almost all of the glasses we've looked at, uh, even if it has got the odd metal put in there uh, in small concentrations like the neodymium we looked at earlier um, but fiber optic cables are actually quite a recent invention uh, this is another laboratory uh, notebook this actually comes from a guy called Donald Keck um, from 1970 so this is this is exactly half a century old um, and this marks the point where he produced the first viable uh, glass fibre cable. And by viable, I mean that it had to be, um, it had to have uh, a loss of light along its length sufficiently low that you could communicate, use it to communicate, I should say, over extended distances. Um, and it was measured in decibels and he's actually got uh, a glass formulation now and he's determined that 
uh, this attenuates, loses light intensity uh, at a rate of 17 decibels per kilometer. So this is extraordinarily transparent glass. That's what it boils down to. Very, very transparent glass. Uh, and you can see that, you know, even scientists get excited when they come up with something that he would have known at the time was, was really quite groundbreaking work. So we get a whoopee up in the corner there. Um, but every good scientist will follow that up, as Donald Keck did, with this next line, check. This has to be reproducible. Uh, it has to be a reliable uh, piece of work that he's done. So the experiment would have been repeated. It would have been repeated with measurements perhaps taken in different ways. All of those things have to take place before you could um, reliably say that you've produced what you think you've produced. Uh, but this was an incredible moment. So in half a century we've gone from the very first viable material through to living on a planet that has been circled many times over uh, in glass fibre so that we can watch uh, video being streamed, for instance, in real time uh, so that we can have ultra fast broadband for all our computational needs, for instance. Extremely important. And all came from this piece of work here and again very much like Otto Schott this was trial and error as a lot of developments have to be uh, guided trial and error it wasn't random in any sense of the word but nevertheless trial and error so one of the things of course that people like me and there are many people like me around the world who study glass in detail using you know more or less sophisticated uh, methods um, one of the things that that you know we will always try and do is to be able to understand why the glass has the property that it does and if we can understand that at the level of its arrangement of atoms for instance uh, the sort of stuff we get out of the diffraction experiments I talked about um, earlier in the series, then we have tools available to us then to begin to predict what might happen if we made certain changes. So we move to a process whereby we can control the design of a material. Uh, and that's actually quite an important transition. It's a transition that scientists the world over have uh, always striven to achieve. Well, glass technology comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And, you know, one of the ones that most of us are familiar with uh, is the glass in our car windows, train windows, bus windows, etc, etc. And actually this isn't a naive material in any sense of the word. So let's take car uh, windscreens for instance as an example. Um, it's actually a very tightly controlled glass design process. So we're not simply talking about producing a sheet of soda lime glass and sticking it you know in front of the driver in a car. It began life that way in the early days of motoring, but it most certainly isn't now. So let me take you through um, some forms of glass. These are actually tinted glasses that are used in, in, in cars. Um, and I'm grateful again to Pilkington for providing me with this, uh, this graph, as well as the samples of coloured glass that I showed you earlier. But we can just walk through the spectrum of light that might be coming through this glass and pick out a few points. One of the things that we always want, of course, is for visible light, so the colours of the rainbow, in other words, to be able to uh, get into us from the outside. We want to be able to see where we're going, basically. So we need a very high percentage of transmission of this light 
uh, in the visible region. So here's our percentage transmission up the side here. And this is up at, I don't know what, 75% or so. But all the way across the visible region, it's quite high. But what we don't want is ultraviolet. We don't want to be able to get sunburn, for instance, whilst we're driving in our car. So the transmission for ultraviolet light is vanishingly small. Our glass has been fabricated, designed to cut out that ultraviolet light altogether. So we're never going to get sunburnt inside our car, which is good news. We also don't want to cook inside there. We don't want a lot of infrared to be trapped inside our car uh, from the sunlight. So in fact, the transmission for infrared, which is a very broad range of um, light wavelengths, is not zero, but it's very, very much lower than it is for visible light. So we're down here at uh, less than 20%. Um, so hopefully we're not going to cook as quickly as we otherwise would have done. We do, however, if we're a passenger at least, want to be able to use our mobile phone. So we actually want microwaves to be able to get in and out because that's what provides the signal uh, for, our, um, for our phone. So actually the transmission for microwaves has gone up again. It's, it's now sort of 40 percentage on this particular curve. We also want to be able to receive radio signals, for instance. Um, so, you know, it stays high all the way through the, um, the wavelengths associated with, with radio waves. So, you know, this is, a, this is a very sophisticated piece of glass that we've got surrounding us uh, in our cars. It will let in radio signals, it will let in phone signals. It doesn't let in a lot of infrared doesn't let in any ultraviolet and majors of course in allowing the transmission of visible light. So it's a it's a very clever uh, piece of material. But we can go beyond that. We can actually now produce um, photovoltaic material, so the stuff that produces energy from sunlight, uh, as a thin almost transparent film um, and it's not perfect so there's an example being held up here for instance and you can see I hope where the photovoltaic material has been deposited onto this piece of glass but it's still pretty good in terms of its transmission of, of visible light so we can go from there to covering the entire glassware, uh, glasswork, sorry, in a building, roofing, windows, whatever we like, uh, with glass panes that have got these thin film solar cells deposited onto their surface. So we can still see through the glass, but we can use it at the same time to generate electricity. So for instance, uh, material of this sort is being used on um, office blocks to run the air conditioning system uh, or the ventilation system. So the brighter the sun shines on the outside, the more electricity we can produce to run our ventilation, our air conditioning systems. But let's go back to the Romans again, because this is a bit of glass technology I want to show you um, that I think is really quite neat. This is something called the um, Lycurgus Cup or Lycurgus Cup. I'm never quite sure which way it should be pronounced. Uh, it's in the British Museum and um, it's a remarkable piece of glassware. It is the only whole one of its kind in the world. And as I say, this is this is Roman. This is a, um, a drinking cup made of glass um, from approximately two millennia ago. And here's the eponymous guy on the outside. Lysurgis is being captured by these vines basically. He's being tied down. It's part of the legend. Um, and you can see that when we shine light on it from the outside we get this sort of olive green, milky green colouring. 
Um, I should point out that the goblet itself would have been um, made by either blowing or slump moulding a piece of glass, probably blowing because it's quite thin. Uh, and this glassware would have been um, laid onto the outside while that glass was still soft. So essentially it would have bonded itself to the thin glass underneath uh, and stayed in this shape when it solidified. So that's lighting from the outside. If we put lighting on the other side, so we put a light inside the cup essentially, we get a totally different colour. So it comes through now looking a, uh, a reddy pink colour. Uh, and this is because, by accident or by design, the Roman um, glass expert who produced this cup in the first place had managed to include inside some metal nanoparticles, so particles that are a few uh, nanometers in diameter. Um, so absolutely tiny. So these are a thousand millionth of a meter across these particles. And what it does in the glass if we shine light through it is exactly the same sort of process that we get when we see um, a red sunset. When the sun's light is coming uh, very low, so edge on in, in, in essence through the atmosphere. And we get a process called me scattering going on. Um, and what that does is enable red light still to travel in the forward direction and all the other colours uh, of the rainbow as it were are scattered out sideways. So that's why we see a red sky, it's why we see uh, this particular cup in um, shown now in um, in red rather than its otherwise green colouring. And it's because we've got these small particles of gold. If you change the size of these particles you change the colour. Uh, so if you make them a little bit smaller for instance we get a yellowy colour, somewhat bigger purple or blue. Uh, we all know what gold looks like you know when the when it's in a bulk form, um, but small particles will scatter light in these really quite peculiar ways and we are sort of working in this region here. Now this was an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. I'm endlessly amazed at the, um, at the ability to produce a piece of glass like this 2000 years ago. Um, a colleague of, my, uh, of mine, um, probably 10-15 years ago now, we tried to replicate this. And it took us, you know, we were doing this in our own time, this was part time, but it took us, even with all the little technological tools and so on we had at our disposal, it took us several months to get something that behaved a little bit like this, it was nowhere as good as this, but it was, had this sort of behaviour to it. Simply because if you put a metal into a glass, its tendency is simply to dissolve, to spread out and become uniform. Uh, and in the case of gold, that gives us something that we refer to usually as ruby glass. So it's got a sort of, you know, lovely cherry type colour to it but it's not dichroic, which is essentially what this cup is. It doesn't look one colour when you illuminate it from one direction and another colour uh, when you illuminate it from, um, from behind, as in this case. So, you know, we went from this, remember, um, all the way through to this. So we've got a completely different problem here. You've got to get metal particles of a particular size, fairly uniform size, to go into the glass without dispersing, without dissolving uh, into the glass. Um, and that turns out to be really quite tricky. And one of the things I should point out, I suppose, here um, is that it wasn't pure gold. It was actually a gold silver alloy that went in there, but nevertheless they managed to get these particles to stay as particles. 
in the glass. An astonishingly difficult feat. So hats off to the Romans. And it's no wonder that this is the only, as far as we know, the only surviving piece of glass of this sort uh, that's still in one piece. Well, let's go on a little bit further. Um, certainly those, I think, in the U3A in Canterbury, a lot of you will recognise this guy. It's a chap called Andy McConnell, uh, who has his um, antique glass business in the south of the county in Rye. So I talked earlier about being able to colour glass by adding metals to it and we've seen several examples of that. So what happens now if we put this particular element in? So it was first isolated back in the 18th century, named after Uranus, so you'll take no time at all to guess that this is uranium that we're talking about. So uranium oxide was produced uh, in the late 1700s and it was being used very shortly afterwards, so within a few years, um, to colour glass. Right, so here we are. Here's our um, vase. Um, not a very pretty thing, uh, but um, nevertheless rather special in terms of its properties. You know, I showed you um, earlier on some pictures of a Caithness vase that had neodymium in it and it fluoresced, you'll remember, um, and that was quite important because it's a way of producing fibre optic cables that can amplify signals, can switch signals and so on, so we get optical computers using materials of that sort. Well uranium does something very very similar. So if I shine ultraviolet light inside you can see immediately uh, that it lights up, it fluoresces. Um, it fluoresces with the, um, with the UV light. If I move the torch inside you can see you know, the, the, the dark part up here, as it were, stays its original green colour uh, and we've got this fluorescence going on underneath. It's actually a very bright green colour. Uh, it, it's swamping the camera a little bit, but that's what it is. So, um, I'll show you one more example. Again, this came from um, Andy McConnell's shop in Rye. Uh, this is a liqueur glass. Uh, it was made in Bavaria a couple of hundred years ago. Um, rather nice. Bavaria was quite famous for its um, glass making technology uh, back then. But you'll notice the stem and the base very clearly a green colour. So if, once again, I put some ultraviolet light on, uh, you can see that um, the base and the stem are fluorescing uh, really quite markedly. It's an amazing thing. Um, I ought to demonstrate for you that this is uranium, I suppose, in the glass. Um, and I can do that using my trusty Geiger counter. Um, so let's just stick that down uh, on the table here. I'll turn it on um, and you'll hear background counts basically. There's nothing very special in there, it is just background radiation. But if I put this near the stem of my liqueur glass, you can hear immediately the count rate go up. Uh, and it's because this contains um, uranium. More specifically, it contains what the uranium is turning into over time, because uranium itself, I have to say, wouldn't um, fire up this particular Geiger counter uh, on its own. Um, let me do the same thing just to prove the point uh, with our um, flower vase. Again, the count rate goes up uh, when we put that nearby. 
Now, let me turn the clicking off. I hasten to add that this is not a health hazard. Um, there are very tiny quantities of uranium. It takes very, very little to produce a colouring uh, in glass. Um, and also, of course, it's in glass, so it's it's sort of trapped in there. Uh, it's not a it's not a health issue from that point of view. So I think that pretty much um, takes us through to the end of video four. Um, there is one more, so when you're ready to look at the final video in the series, then um, please do. See you then. Bye.